It's time once again for another thrilling episode of Mark Out Radio. Of Mark Out Radio. For the next hour, sit back, pull the stick out of your ass, and enjoy. Be warned though, smarks and internet know it alls will be offended, annoyed, and generally pissed off at what's about to happen to your ear holes. You've been warned. Now, Mark Out Radio. That's right, boys and girls, welcome. Welcome back to Markout Radio Goes Nitro. Our boy Dark Fox here with you. I want to fade that out too much. Keep the flavor. All right. Episode 24 of Markout Radio Goes Nitro, February 12th, 1996. Out of the Florida State Fairgrounds in Tampa, Florida. Hosted by Eric Bischoff, Bobby the Brain Heenan, and Steve Mongo McMichael. The show kicks off with a very basic fireworks show. This is only because it was actually the Florida State Fair and George Steinberg actually did pay for WCW to perform there, as Eric does claim. Now, it's not a terrible use of the extra fireworks they're given. I mean, it's the 90s and all, so that would have had to be manual set off by some guy backstage. Um, there are no dark matches, per se, because WCW, like I said, was brought in to entertain fairgoers all week and on the weekend, so there were matches and cards all weekend long. So there's no matches on Monday until Nitro goes live. On the air. Eric leads a Super Brawl recap of still images in the Super 80s theme song background that was that pay-per-view song. You know, I know, you know, a lot of smarks online, including myself, give WWE a lot of shit for a lot of the things they do. But I will tell you this. Having watched the recap video of this and doing the uh, watching the pay-per-view itself... And talking about it last week, I, I really, I, I feel, I really feel like I missed, <laughs> I missed the fucking music. Even if it's from some like indie garage band no one's ever heard of, I still miss the music if this is what they come up with. All right, let's get into the show. Randy Savage defeats Hugh Morris in 4 minutes, 52 seconds. I gave it 3 out of 5. The match itself was excellent. It suffered under what WWE currently suffers from, though, which is the announcers talking about everything except the match going on right now. Now, here's, here's the problem. And it's an ongoing problem. Not all announcers are guilty of this. I will grant you that. But it just seems to be very common. And not just on WWE, but AEW is guilty of this as well. And TNA has always been fairly guilty of this to a certain extent. Um, But that is, it's the announcer's job to put over what's actually going on in the ring while simultaneously promoting what's coming up next and what's coming up in the main event. So the announcers have a a tough job, so I'm not totally shitting on them, but the announcers aren't into the match that's going on right now, and they rarely are because they're constantly focused on the future these days, and as what happened in this match, they forget to talk about the wrestlers in the ring, and the show as a whole suffers. Because why should we, as your at-home audience, give a fuck about what's happening in the ring if you don't? So there's a delicate line you've got to walk as an announcer, I say that having done it like three times in my fucking life. But still, there's that delicate line you got to walk about promoting and talking about what's going on in the ring right now. Talking about what's coming up in the show as it goes on. And, of course, promoting the main events that people keep watching the show that they're actually tuned into. And don't switch over, in this case, the WWF Raw. That being said, it was really poorly done. and And it happens really poorly in wrestling today, too where they just get so fixated on promoting what's coming up next that what's happening right now just ends up falling by the wayside. And it could be a very good match. Like, this is a pretty decent match. Anyways, after this, we get a WCW Magazine promo coming back from break. Mean Gene gets into a promo on the ramp with Steve Grissom, driver for the WWG NASCAR <laughs> vehicle. Now, listen, I, I know a lot of fans outside of the South don't really care about NASCAR or monster truck tie-ins with WCW in general. The fact is WCW is a Southern wrestling company. Their core audience love NASCAR and monster trucks. If you want to appeal to that core audience, you've got to invest some money in those sports. And to be fair, it's really hard to slap a WCW logo on a baseball or football player's ass and let them go on the field. But it's crazy easy to slap some stickers on a NASCAR and only somewhat less complicated to build a monster truck body 
and go ahead and promote your company that way. Now, listen, before I start getting he- hate emails, like pump the brakes just a second here, okay? The car and the truck are complicated pieces of racing machinery. I'm, I'm giving you that, but the body is not. So calm your fucking tits, all right? You're slapping stickers or you're building a body that's going to draw some eyes and advertise your company. So just, I'm not shitting on your redneck obsessions. We all know how hard it is to turn left for fucking three hours. After this, Loch Ness with Jimmy Hart defeats Scotty Riggs in one minute and eight seconds. Zero point zero. I mean, at the start of the show, Heenan claims that Loch Ness is close to 600 pounds. Now, Eric claims that he's close to 700 pounds. Eric's actually pretty close. He is close to 700 pounds. He's 685 fucking pounds. Now, he started wrestling in 1967 as Luke McMasters, although his real name is Martin Ruen. He also wrestled as Haystacks Calhoun. Haystacks Calhoun is actually a pop culture reference. So this guy's been around for a while. He has also worked as Giant Haystacks. And when he worked in Stampede Wrestling up here, he was known as the Loch Ness Monster and was managed by J.R. Foley, who was a... What's a delicate way to put this? A really shitty heel who basically just shaved his mustache like Hitler and came out in army fatigues to, f- to wrestle. <laughs> and listen, he wrestled Stu Hart, so just fucking relax, all right? Anyways, by the time we see him in WCW, he is 50 years old and frankly looking every and moving every bit of that age. He was primarily used as an attraction wrestler for most of his career, not unlike Andre. By this time, though, he was brought in because he was almost seven feet tall and close to 700 pounds, so he was an attraction, and they were building him up to get into a match with Hogan. Nothing wrong with that. And he's literally here to squash Scotty Riggs. Listen, Pillman later claimed that this was one of the reasons he left WCW is that he was being asked to work a program with Loch Ness where he'd lose for the next three months or so. And since the Horsemen and Dungeon were allied against each other, against Hogan and Macho, I really fucking doubt that. But Riggs and other mid-carters would start to job to Loch Ness to put over how dominant he was building up to that feud with Hogan and or Savage. You just never know. It's fucking WCW. Things will change on a dime. Attractions are always a great idea on paper, of course. I mean, when they get into the ring, let's just say they all can't be Andre and Big Show. Riggs worked all of this match and had to do a top rope cross body, which he did right at the perfect spot right at Nessie's shoulders. And by the way, I'm going to start calling him Nessie just because it's a ridiculous gimmick. But anyways, I'm not looking at the guy's arms, but I should have been. Because if you looked at his fucking arms, they're smaller than mine, and I'm just over 220. This guy's arms are so fucking tiny, there's no fucking way in hell I could catch a 240-pound Riggs jumping off the top rope. There's no goddamn way this guy's going to catch him. To his credit, he didn't fall backwards. Instead, he barely got his arms around Riggs' shoulders and leg, between his legs. Okay, listen, you don't fucking laugh. Just put... Grow up. Anyways, he dropped him. He just dropped him like a bag of potatoes. And to his credit, Heenan tried to make it seem like Loch Ness falling on his knees and then falling on top of Scotty Riggs' knees was somehow the plan all along to take away Riggs' high-flying abilities. So hats off to Heenan, um, promiscuously for actually having that call. Now Loch Ness, Nessie drops two big elbows. Sure. Let's call them big elbows for a quick three count with Jimmy Hart trying to wrangle him to perform his post-match, whatever the fuck that is for the hard cam. After this, Mean Gene has a ramp promo with Miss Elizabeth and woman and Flair briefly on a gurney so that Liz can deliver a one-liner that was... Holy fucking shit awful. Now, Flair gets the crowd all worked up when he gets off the gurney and then turns it over to Liz to talk and she takes a cold dump on all of them. And then Flair has to take another shot at getting the crowd into whatever the fuck it was they were supposed to be doing. Now, listen, I'm not going to hindsight 2020 this. Liz was never... A talker, Liz, never did promos that anyone gave two fucking shits about. Liz was a good valet who reacts very well to the wrestlers that are talking 
that she's working with. She cannot actually talk. In this promo, she tried to say that she took half of the house and half of the cars and half of the land that her and Randy had together. All right, well, that's how divorces work. Fine. Why did we need the promo for that? I I guess it's supposed to piss off every divorced man whose wife has ever taken half of what he had. I, I know it's the South, but Jesus fucking Christ. Anyways... After this, fucking get these clowns off the stage. Conan defeats Devin Storm to retain the WCW United States Championship belt in 5 minutes, 19 seconds. I gave it 2.5 out of 5. Here's why. Listen, you might know Dangerous Devin Storm better as Crowbar from his ECW run and I guess sort of his WWF run as well. But this was one of four matches that he wrestled in WCW prior to getting picked up by WWF, WWF for their light heavyweight title division, which Takamichi Noku ended up winning the first time. Now, while Conan's coming down to the ring, he's got his title belt in his left hand and he's got his arms spread wide because that's what he does because he's wearing what can only be described as a parachute. And some kid tried to grab the fucking title away from him. So luckily... He held on to it. And before we go to break, we get to be gifted, just gifted with the awesome and frankly baffling Spanish speaking from Steve Mongo McMichael. Now, back from break, Storm uh, comes shot out of a cannon, uses a chair to jump over the top rope and do a plancha, then tries to use the steps to do something else. I'm not quite sure what it was, but Conan caught him and did a bit of a sloppy powerbomb reversal. And, uh, you know, after the initial high fly speed flippy dippy bullshit at the beginning of the match, they started doing a ground game afterwards, of course, because it's going to go five minutes and who's got the cardio to do five minutes of all flippy dippy bullshit. Now, the problem is, though, that because they did so much of these flippy dippy moves back to back to back to back to back with no pauses in between, the crowd was worked into a feverish frenzy. So when they dropped down to doing a ground game, the crowd basically, well... The crowd fell asleep, uh, which is unfortunate, but that's what'll happen if you do too much too fast, and then you realize you gotta draw the match out a little bit. Now, during this match, Eric discussed last week's power outage and a misunderstanding resulting from the announcers, quote unquote, wondering out loud if the WWE had been responsible. Now, I listened back to it thinking that maybe I've missed something. I don't know. It's possible. Sometimes I get wrapped up in my own bullshit that I've missed some cute little one-liners, but they didn't even come close to saying that. Vince actually, though, did have his lawyers issue a threatening letter that further action claiming that WWF would would sabotage another wrestling promotion would result in a defamation lawsuit. Now, as we've covered on Margaret Radio Goes Nitro before, with the Missy Hyatt settlement, if it's under $100,000, then Ted Turner will almost always settle. So we can assume that since Bischoff is going into a very least amount of damage control possible that he could do, that the threat of this lawsuit is conceivably more than $100,000. Still, it's a bit of a stretch considering all the totally non-war commentary that's been going on on Nitro since it went on the air five months ago. Later on in the match, Eric, again, not talking about this match, but talking about everything except what's going on in the ring, says, oh, we're just trying to have a bit of fun here. Everyone's taking everything way too seriously. Now, I've been doing podcasts for off and on for the better part of a decade. Usually when some jackass says something like that, they're often always the ones that are taking things way too fucking seriously for their own good. So while we're still not at war, we are absolutely in the realm of the passive aggressive angry ex-wife phase of Eric Bischoff's character development. The finish here was Storm getting Conan up on the top rope. He whispers some sweet nothing into Conan's ear, who Conan then tells him no. And Conan Conan does a powerbomb spot again off of the top rope, well, off of the middle rope, actually. But then because he goes to try to flip over for the pin, there's so much bounce in the ring that when he goes to flip over for the pin, Storm ends up flipping over onto his face and has to scooch himself back up on his shoulders. And the ref, to his benefit, draws all the attention to this and waits until Storm's shoulders are both down on the mat, which Storm is the only one doing, by the way. Conan's not doing anything to help before he counts out the three. And by the way, quick count, but whatever. 
After this, we get Arn Anderson with Woman at his side, defeating Hulk Hogan in 9 minutes, 16 seconds. Uh, that one gets a 3.5 out of 5. Macho gets the same spike to the eye, but of course, only Hogan needs a bandage for Jito Boo Boo. The match itself was actually pretty good. The finish was excellent, too. My only criticism here is that Hogan is being Hogan. He doesn't have to be able to take on the entire dungeon solo, but he does. He doesn't have to take on Arn in the figure four while also simultaneously having Flair in an inside cradle, but he does. It makes both stables, factions, whatever the fuck you want to call them, look weak. And listen, one of these stables actually has the fucking champion in it. So it's probably not awesome to make the champion look like a fucking clown. I, you know, it's quirky. I know. I'm really weird. All right. Now, woman blasts Hogan with powder while the ref is looking right at her. I mean, Nick Patrick is the worst ref in wrestling history. Bar none. He could have looked down at Liz. God knows those cans are worth looking at. He could have looked at Flair. He could have looked at Anderson. He could have looked at anyone but woman. What does he do, though? If you look, he's looking right at her. And, of course, there's a gigantic poof of powder. So not only was he looking right in her eyes as she threw fucking powder in Hogan's face, he's walking through the powder batting it out of his eyes and then remembers remembers now to berate woman and ask her what happened which of course she being an actual professional feigns ignorance jesus christ anyways post-match hogan can see again miraculously and waffles flair and anderson into each other you know the double noggin knocker always love that one savage comes down and they clear the ring uh flair heads down to the announce position and breaks bischoff's headset ripping it off his fucking head to cut a post-match promo not to be outdone though with gene trying to get into the ring for a post-match promo hogan instead runs to the announce position breaks heenan's headset trying to get in his rebuttal but by then of course the headsets are off because Ric Flair screaming so loud it's popping everyone's fucking eardrums in the production van. Now, Gene did ma- eventually manage to get in there for his scheduled post-match promo, which he did it on the announcer stage with Hogan and Savage. I have no idea what Hogan was saying. At some point, he said something about Savage being a good fuck. I don't know. What the fuck ever. But anyways, the two of them are on whatever the fuck Warrior usually snorts. And the entire promo was unintelligible. But I guess we're going to have a match next week. I just don't know who the fuck between. So, awesome. There was no Raw this week, which is odd. Since it would have been the go-home for In Your House 6. Now, we don't know how many people were actually at Nitro this week. Or how many people paid. But the seating capacity for Expo Hall is about 10,000 people. The cameramen were careful not to film above the first bowl uh, when the lights were actually up. And even though it's Florida, I really don't think they filled it past that first bowl stadium area. It was a free show, even if it was a free show, excuse me, which allegedly it was because that was the whole gimmick behind Steinbrenner being there. Um, We know, though, that Nitro did a 3.7 in the ratings. And without Raw to program against, you were kind of hoping that both audiences would watch this. So you'd end up with like a at least a four somewhere in the neighborhood of a five nipping on the heels of a six, but really nitro got their audience plus the people that are going back and forth. Now that is not a cut. I'm just saying that only 0.8 of a rating audience is going back and forth at this point is basically what this tells us. Now, as we watch raw, we'll see how much raw steals from nitro when there's no nitro, but um, ultimately at this point, no wrestling show is pulling consistent fours yet. Just hold on, though, because it, things are going to pick up in a few more months. Anyways, I'm sure that WCW is going to chalk this up as a win, even though they didn't actually go up against Raw this week. But, you know, Eric being Eric, it's going to be one of those goofy little marketing gimmicks, right? I mean, let's be honest. Well, that was an abortion of a show. Should the mood take you, check out MarkOutRadio.com and leave a comment. You can also find links there to our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and Stitcher channels. You can even leave a voicemail on our Skype. Just click the links and share them. 